So in the past few lessons, we've been looking at solving equations, both exponential and logarithmic equations, and we're pretty much doing the same thing today as well, but now they're story problems. So we're still solving the equations using the skills we've learned in the previous lessons. We're just putting them in with certain inputs and outputs that explain the story. So these are some common uh, circumstances where we may find this particular equation in that particular story problem. So for example, we've talked about those financial growth formulas. That's uh, explaining you know, the exponential growth model that we've used, but it also shows up in population growth. So for example, over time, you have a certain amount of population that might increase or technically even decrease, right? So you can use population decay if more people are moving out or dying than babies being born or people moving in, right? But even with this exponential decay model, you can use the exponential growth model in talking about population decay because instead of looking forward in time for how the population grows, you can go backwards in time to see where the population had been in an older year. So we'll be using this in one of our examples. Here on the next row, here are some other instances. This is your bell curve, right? There's the official name, the Gaussian model. So if you were to examine SAT scores or some sort of test score where you had lots of scores to analyze, you have lots that achieve sort of this middle score, but a few do really well and a few do really poorly. This is the logistic growth, which has not one, but two horizontal asymptotes. And we see this in a situation where there's growth, but it's capped by like a limited resource. So for example, as opposed to the population growth that we saw earlier, here we have animal population. So imagine you have a herd of deer that live in the forest and they will continue to grow as long as they have food to find. But if they eat all the bushes or if there's a drought, then all of a sudden they don't grow anymore. They've met their maximum cap. Same with the spread of a virus, right? So as long as there's bodies to infect, that virus can spread, but it won't spread beyond the number of bodies that it can inhabit. And then back to our logarithm. We see this in instances like dealing with earthquakes and measuring the Richter scale. So that's a brief overview of the types of story problems we can analyze with these types of exponential and logarithmic equations. So let's go to our examples, back to the financial formulas. We've done financial formulas before, but what we're doing is we're asking a different kind of question. Here's example one. We have $5,000. We're putting it in a saving account. The interest is compounded continuously, so that tells us which of the two financial formulas we're using. At the end of two years, we have this much money, 54, 16, and 50 cents. So the question is, what is the interest rate? So in the past, we've been able to start with a principal and figure out how much money we accrue. But what's different here is that instead of trying to figure out how much money we accrue, we're told how much we started with and how much we ended up with. And so now we can ask either questions like how much time does it take or if we know the time how much of an interest rate do you have and those are exponents so now we're going to use the skills we've seen in our past few lessons to solve for missing exponents that compounded continuously formula that's the pert formula so the amount is the principal times the e raised to the power of rate times time so that spells the word pert right there so let's plug in what we know so the 54 16 50 is on the left the 5000 is on the right that's raised to the power of the rate times the time. So rate is unknown and the time is two. So that's the variable that's up there in the exponent. So we've learned that if you're trying to solve for these, you need to first of all find this little base and the exponent. That's what you want to isolate first. So we're going to divide away the 5,000 from both sides. So we'll use a lot of decimals here because these numbers very sensitive to small changes. I'll put the two in front, so e to the power of two times the rate. So that's our first step, get the exponential piece by itself. Then, in order to solve an exponential, we need its opposite, we need a logarithm, matching the base of e. So we have the natural log of 1.0833 equals the exponent of 2r. So 2r is not the exponent anymore, it is out of the exponent position because we converted it from an exponential form to a logarithmic form. So I'm using my calculator here. Again, we have a very tiny decimal, 
point zero eight three. Um, is that right? Yeah, point zero eight zero zero is what that turns out to be, and then we'll divide away the two. That's our interest rate, point zero four zero zero. So if you move the decimal two spaces to the right, then that means you have a 4% interest rate. And let's look at another variation on this right below that. Uh, you are going to deposit $5,000, excuse me, 500 into a savings account. So now we know the interest rate. Again, we're using the same compounded continuously formula. And the question is, how long until your money doubles? So notice it, it appears as if we have two unknowns. We're starting with 500, but do we know the amount? Yes, we do. Here's the clue. Your money is going to double. So you need to double that 500. In other words, the amount is going to be 1,000. So you only have the variable of time. How long does it take to go from 500 to 1,000 when you have this interest rate? And I've already turned that into a decimal value. All okay, right, so here's our amount of 1,000. That equals the principal of 500 times e to the power of the rate, 0 0.0675, times the time frame of t. There's the variable, All right? So find the exponential piece. There's your exponents on the base of e. You want to isolate that first, so divide away the 500. Sorry, I forgot my base. There's my base of E, and then, so it's to the power of 0 0.0675T. So there's the exponential piece by itself. So to undo an exponent, you need a logarithm matching the base of E. So the natural log of 2 equals 0 0.0675T. So it's not an exponent anymore because we converted it to logarithmic form. Natural log of 2 will give us a decimal value of 0.6931. And then we'll divide away this decimal coefficient to get time by itself. So that answer I'll put down here at the very bottom. So 10.27 years, a very long time. All right, so those are some examples for the financial formulas. Let's take a look at a few other examples. Here at the top of the next page where we have our example using the population growth model. And uh, so I've, I've made this chart, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Just read the situation here. So the population of a city is, and here's the formula. So notice what we have. We have an initial amount. That's how many people we have starting off. In the financial formula, we call that the principal. Here we're calling it the initial amount or the starting population. So P for pr population here. That's my starting population. There's the base of E, so it's growing with compounded growth, continuously compounded growth. But notice we have two variables in the exponent. The k is missing and the t is missing. Well, we know t is time, so what is this k? That would be like the interest rate. That's the rate of growth. We're using k instead of r, but we could use an r because it's a rate of growth. So in the year 2000, we're going to set that off as the benchmark. We'll use time equals zero to represent 2000. So any year in the future, we'll be counting from zero, not from the year 2000. Now we have some historical data. Back in 1984, the population was this much. Okay, so back then, we had less population. And now in the year 2000, we have this much population. So you can see it has grown from 1175 to 1350. That's what you're seeing here in this table. So in the year 2000, we're going to refer to that as time equals zero, and its population was that initial amount, the 1350. But back in 1984, that was 16 years ago, so we need a negative time to go backwards, and our population was the 1175. So notice that what we essentially have is we have an ordered pair. There's my input of time, there's my population. There's my input of time, there's my output of population. So the question is, in the future, in the year 2110, when 110 is my input, what will be the output? How much population will I have? Well, we expect it to grow. The question is how much? But in order to do that, we need the rate of growth, what we're using as the letter K. So that's the first thing, find the value of K. That means find the rate of growth from 1984 to the year 2000. Now that you have the rate of growth, we're going to assume they continue growing the same way so that we can see how many people there are in the future. 
All right, so think of this like two parts. Here's part A, find the rate of growth, and then use this value to, here's part B, estimate the population in the year 2110. So here's my part A. So we're using this formula, and I'm going to use this information here for my time frame of 16 years ago. So here's my population of the 1175. That's going in here. That equals the 1350 times the base of E raised to the power of K, which I don't know, times the time, and that time is the negative 16. So that's being multiplied together. That's not being subtracted. All right, so step number one, you have to isolate that exponential piece, so divide away the 1350 from both sides. So we will have a decimal value of 0 0.870. That equals e to the power of negative 16k. That's an exponential, so undo that with a logarithm. Natural log of 0 0.870 equals the exponent of negative 16k. Natural log of this decimal value becomes a negative 0.139. And now to isolate the variable, we're going to divide both sides by negative 16. So notice negative divided by negative will give us a positive result. So 0 0.00869. That's a very small growth. If you were to move the decimal two places to the right, that's 0.8 of a percent. So now that we have the rate of growth, we can answer the question, how many people are there in this future time frame? So P is what I want to figure out. How many people are there? There's the formula with the 1350. There's the E to the power of rate times time. So the rate is this decimal that we just got, the 0 .00869. And that's being multiplied by the time. So in the future, we'll use the 110 for my time. And notice my variable is by itself, so I don't have to manipulate anything. I don't have to turn it into a logarithm or anything like that. Just type all of that into your calculator, and that will give you 3511.364. So we're going to round that down to, say, about 3511 people. So 3,511. We'll take a look at a couple more. We'll do example three and then down there example five. So example three, here we have exponential decay. You can take a look at the base. There's your base. There's your exponent. Notice the base is less than one. That's how we know it's going to decay over time. So the A stands for the amount of this material. And again, that I stands for the initial amount of the material uh, that you're starting off with. There's your base of one half, and now the exponent is actually a ratio. It's the time that we have, sort of think of it like calendar time, over k, which is another kind of time. It's actually the time it takes for the material to decrease by exactly half. So it's called the half-life value or the half-life number. So suppose you have the half-life of this radioactive substance this half-life number is 1620 years. So if we actually waited 1620 years, our initial amount of 10 grams would be exactly half. We'd have exactly five. So what if we don't wait a full 1620 years? What if we only wait a thousand of those 1620 years? That's why we have this ratio in the exponent. So the amount is found by taking the 10 grams and you're multiplying that by this exponential form. There's your base of 1 half raised to the power of t over k. So there's my 1,000 years that we're waiting out of the 1,620 years that it would take to actually cut it in half. So again, notice my variable is already by itself. We don't have to convert this into a logarithm or anything. We just go right to our calculator. And... Remember we said that half of 10 would be 5. So 5 grams is what would you would get if you waited the full 16, 20 years. But we didn't quite wait that much. So that means it hasn't decayed down to 5 grams. It's at 6.519. All right, let's finish up with an example using the Richter scale. This is example number 5. Here's a little intro. It says on the Richter scale, the magnitude of an earthquake of intensity I. Okay, so let's talk about this. How much energy there is in an earthquake is measured with intensity, but the intensity is often such a big number 
that what we do is we convert it onto a different scale. That's the Richter scale that you know. So the Richter scale is a logarithm, and notice there are two different intensities. The reason why there's two is you might want to compare one earthquake that you had with another earthquake. All right, so you might take today's earthquake and compare it with yesterday's earthquake, and you can see the change between them. But if we're not comparing it to some other earthquake, then that means we just want an intensity of one. So we'll just drop a one in right there, which means the denominator is just one. So find the magnitude of the earthquake given that the intensity is 68,400,000. Yeah, this is why we don't talk about the intensity because the numbers are so huge. We don't even know what that means. So what we do instead is we convert it into a logarithm. So it's, we're taking the log. Notice no base is presented, so that's the common base of 10 of this really big number. So you just go right to your calculator because the variable is already by itself. And that might look more normal. A Richter of 7.835. Yeah, that, that sounds like numbers we've heard in the past. So it takes The logarithm takes these really big inputs and outputs a very small number. And uh, we'll finish up here.